In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Well, a very warm welcome to St Peter's Church here in West Blatchington in the city of Brighton and Hove. My name is Reverend Tim and it's great that you've decided to join us today. Uh, a special welcome to those who are new to the life of St Peter's, maybe even joining us for the first time, in which case it's great that you are able to join with us online. Uh, all of our online services going all the way back to May 2020 hard to believe it now, uh, are still online on our YouTube channel. You can find them all there if there's a particular one you're after. Or if there's a particular uh, theme or uh, perhaps part of the Bible that you're interested in, why don't you leave a comment below and, uh, or get in touch with us and we might be able to point you in the right direction where we've perhaps uh, looked at that theme or a passage. Well, today we're going to be finishing looking at the amazing letter of Paul to the Colossians that we started a couple of months ago and we've been looking at over the course of this summer. Uh, because uh, next week we go into September and a new school term and uh, in our morning service uh, we would normally have Sunday school but because the first Sunday of the month we're going to have our St Peter's at four all-age service in the afternoon. There's also going to be some changes we're introducing a new all-age communion service that's going to be happening roughly uh, once every six or eight weeks or so and there's going to be a new term card that comes out as well so do keep an eye out that uh, for uh, that and uh, um, We'll let you know each Sunday with what's coming up the following Sunday uh, at the very least. Well, let me now lead us in an opening prayer as we uh, give over this time now to worship the living God. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Now before we stand and sing, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession. So if there are things on your heart and mind that you want to say sorry to God for, well, we're going to do that now. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ confessing our sins in penitence and faith, we say, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's spend a moment just to rest in the knowledge of our forgiveness in Jesus. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song where we praise our God. Amen. Well, as God's forgiven children, we are going to now sing together. So if you're able to join in at home, please do sing along to our first hymn.
The first reading is taken from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ, for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf, so that you may stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. For I testify for him that he has hurt, worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Now, here at St. Peter's, we are excited about the future because we believe that God is growing our church. He's growing the church here in West Blatchington. But perhaps sometimes we might feel that this growth isn't happening quick enough or it seems to go up and down a bit. Or maybe it's not growing in the way that we want it to. So I wonder if there are things that you can think of that we as a church or the church in general should be doing in order to experience healthy growth. Maybe you want to put them in the comment section below. Maybe there are things that we need to start doing or things we need to stop doing or maybe things we need to change in order for us to really grow. Do you know, this week I was doing some research online and I discovered a, a website which claims that they have found six really helpful things to help churches to grow. So I thought, great, that sounds good. I'll check what those are. And uh, well, these are the six. It says, firstly, make newcomers feel welcome. Secondly, shorten your sermons. Hang on. Uh, thirdly, ask your congregation for feedback. Fourthly, encourage church members to bring friends. Fifth, share videos on social media. And finally, invite people with text messages. Now, I think there's some uh, really good, fairly sensible ideas there. Uh, the Bible talks about growth, but the Bible doesn't really speak about those kind of things, although they are good ideas. That's because healthy church growth doesn't actually start with just good ideas, but it begins with changed lives. Healthy growth starts with changed lives. Now, as I said earlier in the service, 
This week brings an end to our summer series looking at Paul's amazing letter to the Colossians. You can go back if you've missed any ones before on our YouTube page. And week by week we've been discovering why it's important to have faith in Jesus and also what it looks like to live it out. And this week Paul brings his letter to a close. So what does Paul the Apostle then say that the church needs to do if it wants to grow? Well, firstly, he says it needs to feel a certain way. And then after that, it needs to put two things into practice. So start by feeling something, then put two things into practice. And we should and can apply this to us today. So firstly, what do people in the church then and today need to feel in order to see growth happen? Well, let me read just a few of the commands in this passage to build a picture. Paul says things like keep alert, make the most of your time, see to it and remember my chains. You see, the overall impression of this whole passage, this part of Colossians, is one of a serious urgency. Urgency like you might receive if you had a message from someone who is in desperate need of your help. Come quickly. So church growth begins when people who have faith in Jesus share a sense of urgency. But but urgency for what? Urgency for things like seeing people saved. Urgency for people to experience freedom from sin and addiction. Urgency for restoration of broken relationships and for all sorts of people to grow in their love and knowledge of God. So healthy growing churches are ones that share an urgency, urgency in three ways. Firstly, well, each one of us has a limited and unknown number of days in our life, don't we? We don't know how long we're going to live. So we want to use our time well. Firstly, to turn to Christ, but then to help people to experience the love of God in Jesus. And secondly, other people have a limited number of days. We want to encourage them while they are still with us to turn to Christ and to receive life in his name. So we can know with certainty that they will be with us in God's new creation. And thirdly, we have urgency because Jesus is coming back. And when that happens, there won't be any more time for things like evangelism and and mission. Jesus is coming back. We need to have urgency. If we're going to take this seriously here at St. Peter's or whichever church you're a part of, we can experience healthy growth, but we must be committed both individually and as a church to make sure that we have a sense of urgency. Urgency about people hearing the gospel. We don't just want to put it off and off and off. We want to do something today. But there's one main thing that will make it hard to have that urgency, disbelief. If we don't believe the good news is good and true, then we won't believe it matters whether people have faith in Jesus or not and we won't have urgency about it. And we'll just have a kind of a take it or leave it faith. But that attitude, I'm afraid, doesn't grow healthy churches. In fact, national statistics says the opposite. Churches that experience healthy growth are ones where everyone is united in a sense of urgency to reach out to the lost. And there's no point going on to the next two point actions of healthy growth unless we've got the first one sorted, a sense of urgency. We want to do something, but at the same time we rest in God's strength. I wonder if you've got urgency for your family and friends and neighbours to come to faith in Jesus. If not, well, I challenge you to begin that. So Paul says, firstly, we need to be urgent, but then we need to practice earnest prayer. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. 
People are devoted to all sorts of things. I wonder what you're devoted to. People are devoted to things like football, gardening, bowls, railways, cooking, work, family, computers, and even church. But Paul says we should be devoted to prayer. And in particular, a specific type of prayer. This isn't just asking for things. This is prayer that is alert and thankful prayer. This means our eyes need to be open to what's going on around us and in the lives of others. That might mean making mental or even physical notes of things to pray for as we go about our day. The people that speak to us, the things that we see, make notes of them so we can pray about them. And these prayers must be shaped by thanksgiving, Paul says. But it does beg the question, how can we be thankful if we're praying about something that perhaps is really upsetting? Well, the good news is we don't have to fake it. We don't have to just pretend we're thankful when we're not. But at the same time, we need to remember all the wonderful treasures that we have through faith in Christ. Forgiveness, a new identity, a new family and eternal life. But in particular, Paul is asking the church that they would pray for him to have opportunities, opportunities to share the gospel. But this strikes us as a bit odd, doesn't it? Because after all, Paul is in prison. Surely the most important thing for an apostle should be praying for him to get out, praying that his life would get better so that he can do the work he's been called to do. But no, you see, God is providing him even more opportunities in prison than perhaps there would be on the outside. And the same is true today. I came across this story this week of Bishop Emilio de Carvalho. He served his ministry in Angola and experienced with his church's terrible persecution. He said, if we go to jail for being the church, we shall go to jail. Jail is a wonderful place for Christian evangelism. Our church made some of its most dramatic gains during the revolution, and so many of us were in jail. In jail, you have everyone there in one place. You have time to preach and teach. Sure, 20,000 of our Methodist pastors were killed during the revolution, but we came out of jail a much larger and stronger church. Don't worry about the church in Angola. God is doing fine by us. Frankly, I would find it much more difficult to be a pastor in somewhere like America. There they have so much, so many things. It must be hard to be the church there. For healthy church growth, we must pray for open doors for the gospel, even when those doors perhaps lead down roads that we wouldn't ever choose for ourselves. In fact, in verse 12, Paul gives an example of one such person who is doing that. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf so that you may stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. What a testimony. Healthy church growth is based on prayer that goes out and also prayer that goes deep. So when we pray for each other, well, be like Epaphras. Pray that we would be maturing, growing up in our faith and we would have greater assurance of our identity in Christ. Sometimes that might even feel like Jacob did in the Old Testament, wrestling with, with God all night, pleading with him to do his work in our lives to bless us. Now, if we can't commit to praying as a church, well, we will not grow, I promise you that. Do you know, I'd love to invite you to the next Prayer Together meeting. Please come along here to the church. Even if you don't say anything or you've never been to a prayer meeting before, just come along and be with us. Wednesday the 7th of September. Come and pray with us. Pray for, for ourselves, but also pray for others. Pray for growth and for maturity. Healthy churches grow when they have urgency and an earnest prayer life. And lastly, 
when they behave wisely in the sight of outsiders. Paul says this in verse 5. He says, conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Nothing does more harm to the reputation of the church than when Christians are seen to be hypocritical. When those who should be living a holy life are shown to be doing the opposite. Now, none of us are perfect. And while we are here on earth, we will continue to struggle and we will continue to sin. But it doesn't mean that we don't strive to be more Christ-like in our behaviour. Each one of us are going to have different things to struggle with. I wonder what it is for you that makes it hard to live your life wisely towards outsiders. Maybe it's outbursts of anger or inappropriate language. Maybe it's showing off or gossip or sexual immorality. We're all guilty of these things. But Paul is warning us just how damaging they can be to the church when we fail to practice what we preach. We will not grow. And most especially, it's dangerous with ministers and church leaders. We all need God's grace to grow in godliness so that whoever we are, our lives commend the message of Jesus. That's what Paul is concerned for here. Paul has in mind how we use our words in particular, words that should be gracious and salty, kind and clever. Now, not salty as in rude, but as in acting more like a preservative, bringing life instead of causing harm. Someone once said, Christians should be like salt by making people thirsty for Jesus. I think that's rather good. Now, while all these things are central to how healthy churches grow, through urgency, through prayer, and through acting wisely to outsiders, we shouldn't forget things like making people feel welcome and getting feedback and online ministries and even shorter sermons. But those things aren't what grows the church on its own. Instead, they are able to be used in the life of the church to bear fruit and to help but only as we share an urgency that spills into prayer and wise living, otherwise those things are useless. So over this next coming year, there will be times when we will succeed at this, but there will also be times when we fail and get it wrong. But there's one thing that we should never give up on, and that is following Jesus. You see, the good news of the gospel, the good news of Paul's letter to the Colossians, is we don't have to do this all perfectly. Instead, we live in Christ and triumph and grow through him. Amen. We say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's one of the privileges that we have as followers of the Lord Jesus is that we can pray to the Father through him in the power of the Spirit. And now Zanita is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession. Trinity 11. Let us pray to the Lord who knows all the secrets of our hearts and shows us his mercy and pity. Give grace to the church to have a sense of urgency, to be earnest in our prayers and to act wisely before others. Keep your people strong when their discipleship is costly and their burden is heavy. 
Let us pray for the Anglican Communion, the Anglican Church of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Polynesia. Lord, in your mercy. Let us, let us devote ourselves to praying for others before ourselves and to keep remembering to be thankful for all answered prayers. Restore the world to knowledge of the truth and that we need to show interest in different ministries and also for persecuted Christians and those of other faiths, especially thinking of the ongoing problems in the Ukraine six months on, on the anniversary of their, their Independence Day. Lord, in your mercy. Fill us with praise for the good gifts that you have given to us in families and friendships. Give us grace to use them in your service for the good of others. As we pray for our diocese, the Diocesan Board of Finance, and for our parish, especially those living in Balmoral Court, and for the Women's Social Group, Lord, in your mercy. Visit and relieve all who suffer from cruelty and injustice and under evil laws. Through the suffering of Christ, grant them release and turn the hearts of their persecutors. Let us pray for those known to us who are sick and suffering and for all who minister to their needs. And also, by name, we say Waterbeck, Natasha Breeze, Niraj Harris and Father Daniel, Zoe and family. And those we pray for in our monthly service, Elizabeth Watkins, Leslie Jones, Elaine Tugwell, Linda Wallace, Margaret Dole, Jan and Roger, Alex, Chris, Erica, Liliana and Luca Casula, Will Newman, Christine Jones, Marion Langton, Doreen Elliott, Margaret Shepherd, and Betty O'Connell. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the peace of the departed, whose suffering is over and who rest in your care. Grant them a place in the glory of heaven. We commend to you those known and loved by us who have recently died. And on the anniversaries of their deaths, we remember Michael Lavin, Barbara Bray, John Swain, John White, Arthur Backshaw, Pat Taggart and Joe Butler. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that our petitions may be pure and acceptable in the sight of God. Amen. O God, who declarest thy almighty power, most chiefly in showing mercy and pity, mercifully grant unto us such a measure of thy grace that we, running the way of thy commandments, may obtain thy gracious promises and be made partakers of thy heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us for our online service. Do hope you can join us again, either online or here, next Sunday, 10 a.m. Parish Eucharist, 4 p.m. St. Peter's at 4. And it'll be great to see you soon. Uh, instead of me announcing the blessing, we are going to listen to the blessing being sung. So until we meet again, God bless and take care.